The scripture reading for this morning is Genesis chapter 40. Please stand for the reading of God's word out of reverence for the Lord and his word. Genesis chapter 40. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night, they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream, there was a vine before me and on the vine, there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. This is God's word. It is true, and it is given out of his love. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you. Morning. If you're in town visiting with family or friends for the Labor Day weekend, we're glad you're with us. If you're not a follower of Jesus, we're very thankful you're here. And for the next few minutes, we're going to walk through the passage you, ju you just heard read. And one of the things about our church is you're not here to hear my opinions on things. You want to hear from God. We believe this book points directly to God. Our greatest desire for you is to know God personally. And so 
Uh, I am overjoyed to share the story of God with you. We actually think this whole book, including this early part of the Bible, is about Jesus. Uh, We say that the gospel is the whole story of the Bible, and the way I put it last week is we are going to listen to the gospel and the key of Genesis, and we're going to finish that book this year, and to carry the music metaphor, we'll look at Measure 40. So keep your Bibles open. In fact, I'm going to encourage you, young people in this room, you're committed to vintage. Uh, I'm, I'm encouraging you to bring a thing called a book that actually has paper, and there's even studies that say there's a a learning strength in an actual book, Um, and you can write notes and underline things and stuff. If you use um, a dry erase marker, I guess you could do that on your phones or your iPads as well. All right. Um, We come to this story, and one of the things that it, it, it hits me with is the importance of a wide angle lens as you look at life. And one of the things about growing older is you're learning to look at life, your life, your family's life, the life of our nation and current events globally more through a wide-angle lens because when you are young, it is so easy to think about the narrow moment you are in and only define life by that moment. Even the question that so many people wrestle with before they can trust God is why would God allow suffering in the life of good people? Well, that is a question for the moment. To change the metaphor, we look at the sentence or the paragraph we're living in now, and we forget there's a whole chapter, and there's a whole section, and there's a whole book. And so when you ask that question, you have to be open to the fact that if you could see the entire book, you might go, oh, that's why, and it's glorious. So, young people, I'm going to kind of address you again this morning, although this is for us all, but one of the things I want to commend to you this morning is whatever you're going through right now in the paragraph of today or this month, there's a bigger chapter and a bigger story that makes it all beautiful. I promise you, one day, you're going to look back on that breakup that ruined you, and you're going to look at a spouse and a bunch of beautiful children, and you're going to be so thankful that you got dumped. Or the college you did not get into. And that hurt when they said no. But now you consider the friends you have and the local church you have and the experiences and the actual education you're getting now, and you're like, I am so thankful Harvard said no, or wherever. Each chapter might represent years of your life. It seems long now, especially if you're young, but as you age, one of the graces is to be able to apprehend all of life through a book, not just a paragraph. So here we go, chapter 40 of Genesis. These are dark chapters or paragraphs for Joseph. This whole episode of him getting sold out into slavery and then the Potiphar's house and now in jail, this is 13 years of his life. This isn't just a year, okay? In two chapters, though, he will be second in command of the mighty 12th dynasty of Egypt. God is doing something, even in this moment in prison. Joseph will see through the wide-angle lens one day, and he will realize God was with him the entire time, at every moment. There was no moment in Joseph's life that he was forgotten by heaven. And one day, I promise you, you will also realize this. You will look back at your life and say, oh, just when I thought I was abandoned, God was with me. He was with me the whole time. He was at work. He has got this now. He has got this now. Lord, would you do this work in our lives, enabling us to remember that you remember with an infinite, eternal, white-hot passion of memory, and that you, moment by moment, are zealous to take this sentence or this paragraph and to make it part of a whole story that makes it more than worth it because you yourself are worth it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 says, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Again, when you get grizzled and lose follicles at my point in life, one of the things you start to do 
is to downplay your decisions and your actions and all of that, and you realize God is sovereign, and he has written this story, and I need to trust that more. So Joseph, in chapter 39, made a decision based on his values not to sin against God. However, when you decide not to sin against God in many, time, in many situations, that will mean you have to sin against the ways of this world. So he sins against Potiphar's wife. And so she causes him to go yet a further mile down into the valley of darkness. So we get to our passage and we, three, we see three sections. Number one, unplanned missionary service, verses 1 through 4. Second section, I had a dream, 5 through 19. Then finally, the most important memory, 20 to 23. So first, unplanned missionary service, verses 1 through 4. Joseph's faithfulness led to suffering, as is the case with many Christians. Joseph is now at another trough. Just when he thought he was climbing up the ladder, he falls down more rungs. And yet, even though that stinks, it's horrible, that's not what he wanted, he's suffering, Joseph has learned some things by now. He has fallen down enough rungs that this is not his first rodeo. He's beginning to have sanctification scars that are telling him that God is still going to be faithful now. Even though he's gone through the disappointment of turning around the corner and hoping that everything was going to open up into sun and a beautiful meadow from the dark forest, realizing there's more pathway in the dark forest, he is ready more than ever with greater maturity to trust God. Now, young people, one of the most helpful things said to me was that you should start to aim to live with a wide angle and a big picture of your life. But until you're in your 40s and above, it, it, the penny doesn't fully drop, okay? And so what you need now is to have older voices in your life to begin, begin to set that foundation in your heart so you're on the trajectory of coming to that place when you're in your 40s and 50s and older to really know that God is good to you in a moment of affliction. And so I remember uh, when I was a college pastor, uh, we had a church where we had morning services and then a separate evening service that you were meant to come back to. And there's a growing group of young people in our church that would love to have our Sundays bound by that. Some of you are like, but I would not. Anyway, got to go with the youth, right? Um, and so after that evening service, we would go to a family's house. It was walking distance from the church. And there were evenings where we would slam 60 or 70 college students into that house. And there was food, of course, because we're two or three are gathered and there's food. There the Lord is as well. And, um, and then after about half an hour of hanging out and eating, we all gathered in the living room. But there would be times where the whole living room was covered. There were students going up the stairs and adjacent rooms looking in. And we would bring older saints to come speak to the college group who were just members of our church. And you, a single person or a married couple. And they would share their story Definitely how they came to know the Lord, but also just how God had worked in their lives, especially in hard moments. And every one of them had that story. And, and again, by the time you get to my place in life, you have had some moments that were tremendous tests and sufferings. And you've experienced God meet you there. And so they share these stories. And week after week, I will remember these students would be sitting there wrapped with attention as older saints were planting seeds of future grace in their life, preparing these students to hit those moments when they were older, in their 30s, in their 40s, preparing them to trust God, that the God of the gospel is the God that was going to carry forth the gospel in all of their life. We call this after hours, and I just so valued those moments. So, an application. Older people in this room, I'll let you decide what that means. Homework. Would you pray that God would bring a younger saint to you to pour seeds of the gospel into that life? Older men, would you pray for a younger man to come into your life? Older women, would you pray for a younger woman to come into your life? Now, you younger people in this room, we've heard it. 
This is a wonderful sign of God's grace in our church. There's lots of younger people in this room that want to be discipled by an older man or woman. And so here, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Look out at this body and see someone that's been walking with the Lord, has, had, has some scars of sanctification on their life, have persevered, who are mature, and ask them to pray about meeting with you on a regular basis, going through the word, but also just going through life, how the gospel applies to every part of life. There's ways we can structure this, and that's good, and we'll think about that. But quite frankly, the beauty of this will be organic, that there, we just have a culture of older men pouring into younger men, older women pouring into younger women. And so would you pray about that even this week? So as the story continues... We have Joseph in this jail, but two guys join him. And these two guys were the chief cupbearer of Pharaoh and the chief baker. And these are more than kitchen staff. They are high officials. They're part of the trusted inner circle of Pharaoh and his court. Part bodyguard, part lieutenant, that Pharaoh trusted them to protect him from poisoning and other things. Some suggest that the chief cupbearer was like a prime minister, And also, by the way, some believe that Potiphar was the captain of the guard in the prison. So he was looking out for Joseph there. He had made Joseph have a lot of leadership in his house. Now he was going to protect Joseph and give him leadership in the jail. So these two guys, the cupbearer and the baker, sin against Pharaoh. In fact, the word there, not just offense, but there's a sin against Pharaoh. We don't know what it was, but it was bad enough to get them in jail. So here we have this contrast. Joseph is the man that would not sin against the true king, chapter 39, verse 9. But we've got these guys that were willing to sin against the little king. And, and by the way, in, in Egyptian society, the Pharaoh was considered a god, right? So they sinned against their god. Okay, so here we have this story. We have an innocent man, Joseph. And on either side of him, so to speak, are two guilty men. Hmm, that sounds like something familiar. Maybe we should return to that in just a second. All right, on we go to the next section. From unplanned missionary service in a jail to I had a dream in a jail, 5 through 19. Dreams, dreams, dreams. Chapter 37, Joseph has dreams. Those dreams are interpreted. We have dreams in the book of Daniel, chapter 4 and chapter 25. Dreams are always showing up. God is using those dreams, and he's usually using a prophet to interpret those dreams. Now, the thing about dreams is they were important to pagan societies. Uh, The Babylonians and Daniel, and now in Egypt, dreams were a big part of their, their cult, their idolatry. And as you study some of Egyptian dreamology, we'll call it, you, you see four parts to their structure, even from the hieroglyphics. One, the dreamer usually was a character in his or her own dream. Two, these dreams often foretold the future. Three, they were allegorical. So in the characters, you, you had to de- define, like, this character means this in real life, and this event is pointing to this in real life. They're allegorical. And then finally, and some of you will not be excited about this, Uh, They were full of puns. And so if I was to go back and do a PhD, I would have done a PhD in ancient Near Eastern puns and studied hieroglyphics. All right, that sounds like a pyramid scheme. So let's move on with the passage. The author here, Moses, goes out of his way to cast this as a sovereign moment. So these two guys have dreams, and the word that is attached here is interpretation. Interpretation. These aren't random brain firings in the middle of sleep, but these are sermons, so to speak. And Joseph is a prophet or an expository preacher who's going to hear the dreams described, and then he's going to interpret the meaning of these dreams. Joseph is also a shepherd. He's there in jail, and he sees these two guys, and I guess they look pretty distraught, and he's like, hey, what's what's going on? And they say, well... Uh, we got thrown into jail here, and we're, we had these, these dreams that were kind of unsettling to us. So he says, all right, uh, let me hear them. I, I, I've got a gift with these things. But he makes it very clear that he's going to give God glory. He says, doesn't the interpretation belong to God? He is just the instrument. 
A good prophet always says, thus saith the Lord. It's his word. I am just the instrument. I am just the mouthpiece. So he sets them up to describe their dreams. And the chief cupbearer goes first in 9 to 15. And he talks about these different things. And you got the repetition of three. And you can tell it's allegorical. Something's going on here. And as a true prophet of God, he's given immediate knowledge. And so the, the interpretation of the dream is good news. The cupbearer is going to be released from jail and he's going to be put in, back in good graces with the Pharaoh. Now, Joseph, in response to this, says, all right, now that I've given you this good news, look at verse 14. He says, only remember me when it was well with you. Please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh and so get me out of this house. Understandable, right? He wants out of there. So in this moment, he's doing what I think Jesus asked us to do, and that's to be wise, right? To be a shrewd servant and steward. He's wanting reciprocity. Now, that's okay. The question is, is Joseph going to put all of his hope on the cupbearer to remember him one day when he's back in power? And so we'll see that answer as we go. In fact, the next verse is going to be telling So he he continues to tell the cupbearer, for I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. Did you notice how he described his past experience there in chapter 37? Did you notice what he did not say? He did not name his brothers. He just said he was stolen, and that he was unfairly put in a pit, and now he finds himself in this jail. I think Joseph, because of godliness, is protecting his brothers so that in the future, there was an open door for them to receive grace. And so I think this whole moment is showing that he is going to trust God. He knows that there's a bigger story here, and he's inviting his brothers to the story of grace and redemption because he knows that if he guts out of there and God redeems this and puts him in a position of high power, having basically uncovered what his brothers have done, is that Pharaoh or somebody else might have taken vengeance on them. Wow. Think about that. That is a heart that is freed by the grace of God in suffering. He is working now even to protect his brothers so that they have a chance at future grace. So now having this, heard this good news, the chief baker's like, oh, oh, let me share my dream so that you can tell me good news. And so he tells them and he's got these different imagery and baskets and birds and all of this stuff. And again, immediate knowledge. The problem, not good news, bad news. Okay. The chief cupbearer is going to have his head lifted in nobility, and the chief baker is going to have his head lifted, period, right off, you know, and he's going to be hung on a tree. Literally, this was probably like a 20-foot wooden pole with a a sharp um, point that his body is impaled through, left there hanging, no head, birds coming and feeding off his dead body. Wow. Okay. Now, one of the things about a prophet is that he's going to tell the bad news, if that's the truth, regardless of the consequences. Knowing that if somehow the baker lived and was put back in power, he could have been uh, attacked, you know, in the future for giving him bad news. But he is a prophet. He's going to tell the good news, and he's going to tell the bad news. Well, time goes by, and we come to chapter, or verses 20 to 23, the most important memory. And three days later, note that, three days, is Pharaoh's birthday, and the prophetic interpretations come true. They come true. The chief cupbearer is lifted back to nobility, finds himself back in his garden of delight. You might call it paradise. And the chief baker falls into judgment that he deserved And then you've got this Joseph character who's pivotal, who's an anchor. And yet he's still the innocent man that is taking on the unjust conviction that he did not deserve. So you've got an innocent man and a guilty man that is forgiven and a guilty man that does not want forgiveness. And does that remind you of anything? 
If you've got your Bible, turn with me to Luke 23. We might call this the Lucanization of Genesis or the Gospelization of Genesis 40. This is the account. Jesus is on a tree being hanged for us as our Savior. And picking it up in verse 32 of Luke 23, two others who were criminals. That's actually not the best translation. They were insurrectionists. They weren't thieves. They were men that wanted to gain power back from Rome using human violence. And they are contrasted with the true king who is dying, giving himself out of love in between them. And they were led away and put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they were crucified. They crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, looking at the whole crowd, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots dividing his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the ruler scoffed at him saying, he saved others, let him save himself. Or he remembered others. Let him remember himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself, remember yourself. There was also an inscription over him, this is the king of the Jews. Now one of the criminals or insurrectionists who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do not fear, do you not fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to him, get this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now the tables are turned, right? It is the guilty criminal who is acting, who is asking the Lord God, to remember him. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be remembered. In fact, you will be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. Friends, number one, Jesus is both the king and the sacrifice at the same time. He is everything Pharaoh wanted to be. He is God incarnate. And yet he is also the one who died in our place as the sacrificial lamb, taking our sin upon himself. Number two, Jesus will be good to his promise to remember the repentant believer. That goes for each one of us as well. He remembers, he sees, he is never looking away at every nanosecond and every space in the universe. Jesus remembers the repentant believer. Number three, Jesus was betrayed, handed over, forgotten by his disciples. Even one of his closest friends, Peter, pretended like he didn't know Jesus, betraying him, distancing himself from Jesus. And yet God remembered. The Father saw him. The Father would redeem this. And Jesus believed that down to the core of his being. And then finally, fourth, Jesus died for all of us cupbearers. You know that everybody in this room is a chief cupbearer, right? He died for us. Now, some of you in this room might have come in as a chief baker, not wanting to have anything to do with Jesus. There's only one thing getting between you and Jesus, and that is your desire to have grace or not. Do you want to live according to your own power, merit, performance? How's that going for you, by the way? Do you not want to come to the one who says, look, I I want nothing except your need, and I want you. I will provide the forgiveness. I will provide the performance. I will provide the way. Come to me. So if you don't know him, I invite you to come to be the one that says, Jesus, remember me, and he will say, yes, today. You will begin the journey to paradise. So give your heart to him. Be honest, own the sin and the brokenness that maybe the Lord right now is working on you. Give it to him. And not only does he wipe your slate clean, he gives you his righteousness. He literally attaches you to his life. You have life before death, not just after. Come to him today. Well, that gets us then to some closing thoughts from this passage. And I entitle this, Forgotten by Men, remembered by God. The last line, look at 
the last line with me, 40 verse 23. But for God, but for God, that is the literary crescendo of this passage. You are meant to read that and feel haunted and at the same time hopeful because it's leading to chapter 41, right? It's transitionary, but man, it's powerful. Joseph is forgotten by the cupbearer. He's forgotten by everybody, but he is not forgotten by God. How many of you have been skydiving in this room? Anybody? A few? Is that it? First service had more. Okay. Uh, For the one of you that has been skydiving, I will never join your ranks. Okay? Nor bungee jumping. These things are not from God. Okay? Um, (laughs) But I am told that unless you, like, train a lot and get some kind of accreditation, you can't go by yourself. So you go with somebody else, a trained professional skydiver, and they're tethered to you. You go tandem. So I can only imagine... No, I really can't imagine. I'd have to be sedated. Um, <laughs> y- you jump out of a plane, and you, you have all of your stomach going up into your head and all the woozy, and finally you hit terminal velocity. Then you're composed enough to think, I am going to die. The ground is coming up at me at a great speed, and I am going to die, and I'm going to die alone. When suddenly you feel that tap, 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 And you realize, oh, I'm tethered to somebody who knows what they're doing, and their future is connected to me, so there's a really good chance they're going to pull that cord when they're supposed to pull it. And friends, that's you and Jesus, right? Like when you question whether God remembers you, you got to have this instantaneous realization that you're tethered to Jesus. So does God the Father ever forget God the Son? It's impossible. You'd rupture the Trinity, which is impossible. That's ludicrous. So, inasmuch as the Trinity cannot be ruptured, God's love cannot be separated from you. And so wherever you go, wherever you are, whatever has happened to you, God is remembering you because you are tethered to Jesus. And so some of you maybe today are in a jail cell, so to speak, And you need to be reminded from the story that God dwells in forgotten wastelands and enjoys building gardens while you wait. At no point is this just lost time for Joseph. God is building a garden in that cell. Your wait is part of God's work. Listen to Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore he exalts himself to show you mercy. Did you get that? God gets glory by giving you mercy. So that is a 100% chance that God will give you mercy. Because he's honored by it. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Young people, listen to this. Life is mostly waiting, punctuated from time to time by a fulfillment. And if that is your gospel expectation, man... You will save yourself from a lot of unnecessary emotional trauma because you have been told that life should be one long fulfillment punctuated by an occasional wait. But we are waiting, and yet God is working. God is building an Eden, a paradise in your waiting. And and friends, the time frame is really not our human life. The time frame is us waiting because we know that Jesus will return and he will start a fulfillment that will never stop forever and ever and ever and ever. And so that brings us to Romans 8.28, which we heard last week. And now it's the Apostle Paul, the guy that has found himself in jail and beaten and robbed and night uh, sleep, uh, beaten 39 times, several times over, almost to death, almost stoned to death. And he says, and we know that for those who love God, and and think about that as your expectation in life is God. Your values, God. Your priority, God. Not getting out of jail, God. For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. This thing works together? Yes. That thing works together? Yes. V. Raymond Edmond, the fifth president of Wheaton College, 
said this, delay never thwarts God's purposes. It only polishes his instrument. Delay never thwarts God's purpose. It only polishes his instrument. For you to wish this thing away quicker than God's design is to say no to his grace and his polishing of your life. So transactional relationships only get you so far. I think Joseph knew that. He's like, man, hey, try and remember me. But if you don't, it's okay. Because Joseph is going to rest in the one who has a covenant love for him, not transaction. And so that brings me to the American church. And Chapel Hill Bible Church is in America, so we're part of the American church. And yes, we're going to do this every week. It's very much on purpose, okay? As we prepare our hearts for this most smooth election season ahead of us, where we're all on the same page and see life like the exact same way, right? And um, it's really good for us to say, Lord, I, I, I pray for people who are in high power, kings and authorities, that's what Paul said we should do, so that there is the greatest ecosystem for the church possible. At the same time, Paul was saying that in a historical moment where the church was persecuted by Rome. Um, And where I think we go off is that the American evangelical church struggles to avoid a transactional relationship with the party of our choice to be our functional savior. And so we are told that this is going to be the most significant event in our lives this fall. And friends, if you are a Christian, that is just not true. The most significant event that has ever happened in human history happened 2,000 years ago at Calvary. Thank you. Presbyterians, can you say amen as well? Amen. Okay, good. I know. Some of you, I'm just going to get a crinkled eyebrow, and that's like the Presbyterian way of being slain in the spirit. But... um, We need to remember we have a covenant God. And what if it's the covenant God's purpose that we enter into more persecution and marginalization, which will lead to a more holy and righteous and faithful church that is actually going to see a radical renewal? Is that worth it? Yeah. So, man, we got to have the wide angle. And then a final word. Um, God never wants people to feel forgotten by him and one of his greatest tools is other Christians that are going to be tethered to people who have long-term hurt and burdens so that they are reminded through that other Christian and their ongoing long-term love that God has not forgotten them. And so there are people even in our church that have burdens and hurts that will never leave them until Jesus comes back. Um, Like the widows and the widowers, the divorced, the ill, the unemployed, those with special need children or family, folks with aging parents who require lots of service, and those who are burdened in, in general. It is such a grace to make sure that we are in there in the immediate crisis, yes, pastoral care, meal trains, yes, but that the the care doesn't drop off three months or six months later when the rest of us want to get back to life, that that we need to hang with people for five years and 10 years and 20 years. Um, what, What would it look like for life groups to say, okay, we're pledging to walk with this brother or sister for the long run, or a parish ministry to say, we have this person And this burden will never be lifted until Jesus comes. So we're going to tether ourselves so we can be that little knock, knock, knock. Hey, you know I'm here. And ultimately, I want to to point to Jesus because Jesus is tethered to you. What a grace. um, We have testimonies, unfortunate testimonies, of women who have lost their husbands way too early in our body. And I think we were very good at immediate care, shepherding, things like that. Um, And this isn't just us. I think a lot of churches, life goes on, right? And um, and several of those women, I have noted, have left our body. Um, No no bad intent, nothing like that, but we just didn't realize, like, when you lose a spouse, um, especially after decades of marriage, that that is a, a wound 
that does not fully heal the side of heaven. And I would love to be a church where we walk with each other over the long haul, right? And we're, we're there 10 years from now. And we're, we're continuing to check in and, and see how people are doing. And I really think the gospel of Jesus Christ will be magnified as we do that. And the truth of this passage will be magnified as we do that. Because God loves his people to remember that he remembers. And it takes a church to do that.